Perfect. I think that we're now recording. I really appreciate you both uh, joining me tonight. I know that uh, you're acing this course and you're you're doing really, really well. So um, I think it's evidence of, of your commitment that you're here. Please know that I totally understand if you need to step out, uh, if other things come up. Uh, I will try today really, really hard to keep it kind of within our uh, predefined time parameters. Um, so it's kind of a busy week for us on this Bio 201 uh, class. So what we've got aligned up uh, is covering two chapters, chapters six and seven. And in addition to that, we also have our first exam and first practical. And I really wanted to make sure that we have time, especially for you, since you're here present, uh, to cover anything that's a special interest to you or that you're especially uh, feeling that would be helpful. So uh, feel free if you have something in mind, just uh, unmute yourself and share it or drop it to the chat. Or if you don't have anything particular, I do have things on mind that we can cover tonight, uh, but I just want to make sure that you have that space if there's something particular that you want to uh, address. Uh, feel free to do so either now or even if it comes up later on. That's totally fine as well. Well, what I'm doing, I'm sharing, you should be seeing my Microsoft uh, PowerPoint screen. Uh, if for some reason you're not seeing it, give me a shout out. Uh, I normally have been very big on my classes, whether it's in uh, person or online of just creating that little space for us to connect and check how everything is going. Uh, so again, there is absolutely no pressure, but uh, I think that one thing that has been very helpful for me uh, with the students, especially when it's in a remote mode, is to hear kind of just like, how are things going? And if we use a scale from one where th things are as bad as it can get, uh, that we're barely surviving, and then five would be that one is living their best life. If you feel like it, feel free to drop that to the chat. I don't think the chat gets recorded, so it doesn't get shared to anyone else, but it gives me an idea uh, in full transparency. Um, if you share that things are kind of rough, I probably will reach out. It's not to intimidate you, but just to check if there's any resources that we can offer. But also if uh, using the chat is not convenient for you, don't feel that you have to share. But I'm always, uh, I would do it in my in-person classes. I wanna do it also in uh, online classes, just to see that how are things going? And it doesn't even have to be about this class, just in general. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that everything's going well. Uh, the question was just, how are you? <laughs> number one being on a scale from one to five, number one being th that it's horrible time in my life, and number five that I'm living my best life. Um, it's just really that I do honestly care, and I want to make sure that uh, if there's something that I can do uh, to help, we do that. I did see on the chat that everything's going well, it's just busy time. Uh, I completely understand. I think that uh, it is a hectic time. So I'm, I'm glad to hear um, that it is okay, although it's hectic. I, I realize that and I recognize that. Uh, one of the thoughts that immediately comes to my mind regarding, since I'm hearing that students are finding it hectic, is that uh, since we don't officially have the college open on Monday, uh, I wasn't going to start teaching next week's materials formally or make announcements until on Tuesday. Uh, of course, all of my coursework is open for you even, even already now. Uh, what I might do is that I just extend the due dates for this week if that relieves some of that stress. So uh, I'll think about it. I'll come up with some sort of a plan and uh, I'll communicate it through the announcements. But I think that you can expect that just if it helps at all, 
I will be probably adjusting those due dates, giving a little bit more time for this week's assignments. Uh, I know that exams and practicals are kind of intimidating, so I don't want anyone to go into those feelings that you don't have time to ace it. But if any other ideas come to mind, always feel free to drop them to me uh, through Canvas messages or other uh, means. In terms of the um, weekly meetings, I'm probably dropping the Wednesday meetings that I had initially scheduled because I'm in those meetings alone and that's okay that I'm alone, but I think that we can cover everything that we need to on the uh, these Thursday evening meetings. Uh, you do still have access to me in many, many different ways. Uh, I offer the online office hours on, on from Monday to Wednesday from 1 to 3. Uh, so that's always available. Uh, I will set up meetings other times, but these regular live online sessions, I'll, I'll do them on Thursdays from moving now on. And as always, I'll record them as well. So, uh, I know that you're probably fully aware of that since you said that it feels like a hectic week and uh, all the things that we're doing this week. So, we have the chapters 6 and 7 and for chapter 6, I have the chapter quiz and I have the practice anatomy assignment. In addition to that, for chapter 6, we had our first food for thought assignment, which is really just a short answer. Uh, question. I'm looking for one paragraph or so in length. Uh, I've already received some really amazing uh, answers to that. It's not due yet, but some students have been eager to get it done. Uh, so expectation is not that you have to do a long answer. Expectation is that literally like three, four, maybe five sentences uh, one par paragraph should be more than enough to get full marks for that. But then I have students who are overachievers. If you've already answered or if you're planning to answer to that, uh, don't be surprised if you get higher marks than what I've marked there as a maximum if your answer just goes above and beyond. But there is no pressure, no stress on doing so. Uh, but I just want to be transparent about that. I feel like a lot of the time on these courses, we don't get to have that kind of feedback element. So those food for thought questions are where you will get a lot of written individual feedback. Uh, so that's why I include those. In addition to chapter six assignments, we also have chapter seven that has a quiz and practice anatomy as well. I know that uh, students are always kind of like, how do I prioritize the workload? Since in addition to those chapter six and seven homeworks, we also have the exam one and practical one. Since exam one and practical one cover the chapters one, six and seven, I would encourage you to work through the homework first and then tackle the exam and practical. And hopefully by the end of the day, you'll see that the exam and practical are not really anything scary. Uh, they're really same stuff that you've already covered in the homework. So it's kind of a uh, benefit if you have completed your homework quizzes and practice anatomies in terms of tackling the exam and practical. Uh, I will probably, like I said, move some of the deadlines a little bit later, uh, probably until some point of the next week, just so that you don't feel stressed or worried. But I'll communicate about that after this class, probably tomorrow. So that's what I'm looking for uh, us to do uh, this week. Students are quite understandably really curious what the exam one entails. So here I have this little uh, kind of a summary of what to expect. So you'll see on that that it really covers those three chapters uh, that I've mentioned. So the chapter one, which we looked at on the week one, that. On chapter one, we saw things like anatomical terminology, directional terms, uh, body cavities, some very, very basic concepts, concepts like homeostasis. And on this week's chapters, uh, integumentary system and the cartilage and intro to the bone, we really look at the skin, the associated structures to the skin. So that includes things like uh, various different kinds of glands that we find on the skin, 
hair and nails. Uh, and then on the second chapter, we kind of make a move of starting to think about the skeletal system, which is very basic introduction to the bone and the, uh, I would say, bone tissue. In addition to that, I spend a little bit of time looking at the different kind of cartilages, because cartilages and bone are so closely connected. So those chapters are covered in the exam one, and I'm going to be totally uh, clear. There's only 11 questions on the exam one. They are either multiple choice or drop down menu matching uh, true or false questions. So there's nothing where you have to write or produce a paragraph or something like that. Uh, those 11 questions are either directly or very, very closely paraphrasing wise uh, from the quizzes that you have taken for chapters one, six and seven. So that's why I encourage doing those quizzes. Uh, remember also that the exam, as well as practical, is open note, open book. So if you have taken notes while you've been doing those quizzes, or if you have been taking notes while you've been covering materials, please utilize those. That's important for me that you know where to find the answer. Uh, to answer the 11 questions, uh, I've put you to have 30 minutes, so that's more than ample of time to answer to those. Really, most of the time students answer to a question in less than 30 seconds. But that gives you that little room of time if you need to research or check something from your notes, from your textbook, or wherever you wish, that you have that access as well. Um, I'm giving 30 minutes. Uh, like I said, and I'm setting it up or I have set it up so that it has to be completed on one setting. So once you start taking the exam, uh, please don't close it or wander off and think that you're going to come back the following day. Because once you start the exam, the 30 minute counter starts and uh, then I'm looking that you finish it within that. I do realize that things happen, computers crash, internets go down and stuff. So if for some reason something happens that prevents you from completing it in one setting, just drop me a message. I will reset the exam for you. Uh, like you see, the exam is worth of a little bit more points than other assignments that we have done up to the point. Uh, so it is definitely worth of doing it. Uh, it's going to add up towards your final grade. Uh, like I said, it is not a proctored exam, so you don't have to use any kind of screen lock browsers. You don't need to have a video camera looking at you. Uh, you don't need to uh, do it in, in any uh, setting like that. You can choose where it's comfortable for you. Uh, you can use all of your notes, all of the other materials that you can think of. Uh, I typically recommend to the students, though, that I try to find a place where it's comfortable for you to do so, uh, that you wouldn't get interrupted halfway through that. Um, other thing that I encourage students, but I don't dictate it, is that I would avoid doing the exam and especially the practical on a mobile phone because sometimes the pictures don't show up correct. But really, that is the exam, how it's laid out. I have two example questions there at the corner of the screen. I know they're a little small. So the first example question, and I think that these are literally questions one and two from your exam. The first example question is a true false statement. And the statement says that negative feedback negates or reverses a trend. And obviously we remember that that is indeed true. So when we have negative feedback, what we're trying to do, we're always trying to keep body in kind of a consistent state, in equilibrium, so that things don't change. And by negative feedback, if there's a change that's happening, we're now stopping that change from happening and bringing the body back to that normal state. So that statement would be true, that negative feedback reverses a trend. Uh, an example of that would be, for example, your body temperature 
rising too high, you're getting too warm inside. So what your neg negative feedback in your body would do, it would trigger changes like you sweating and potentially leaving the direct sunlight, uh, maybe fanning yourself, uh, getting the air moving, drinking something. So those would be all responses in a negative feedback that try to bring our body temperature back to that normal. So uh, to stop that change from happening. The second example question that I have is a complete sentence question. And I think that on that one, I give you multiple choice format, a few different options, and you choose the option that best aligns. And the statement reads that most anatomical terms can be traced back to, and then there's a blank and another blank. So we're seeing that most anatomical terms can be traced back to, for example, the Latin language. Uh, and then there's another one, and I'll let you figure that out uh, yourself. So really, you would just choose the answer. So I don't think that that should be scary, the exam. If anyone's super stressed, uh, let me know either whether you're here or whether you're watching the recording, and I will work with you. I don't want anyone to lose their sleep over that. And like I said, it's only 11 questions, uh, so it's, it's not a long one to take. But it's definitely worth of taking because those points do add up. In terms of the practical, uh, practical covers the same chapters, and this practical contains 13 questions. And these 13 questions are exactly directly from your practice anatomy assignments or uh, very, very closely similar to that. Sometimes I change some wordings and I want to avoid uh, doing any copyright issues. So I might do slight tweaks so that we're not using someone else's material. So those 13 questions, uh, you have 30 minutes to answer to those. And again, I think the typical student takes about uh, I would say 30 seconds per question to answer. Uh, those questions are typically that you see a picture and then I have multiple choice options underneath it that which term describes the picture or which uh, whatever the options that I'm offering uh, answer to what I'm asking about the picture. And typically there's an arrow or there's some sort of a, a symbol in the picture I'm asking you to identify that. Um, again, these would be completed in a single setting on one go, and you can use any notes, any materials that you have, even if you need to go back to revise some of your old practice anatomies. Uh, here we see a sample question. You're being showed, shown different planes of the body, and it's asking which plane is indicated by that arrow. Uh, and there's a few different terms that we can use. Sometimes we give alternative terms, so I don't remember exactly what them I offered there, but that one name for that plane would be coronal plane, but there might be other names that I've also given. So you just choose the most correct option from that. Um, like I said, not a scary uh, activity. It, it does add up to quite a few points, so I would definitely encourage you to do that, uh, but don't lose sleep over it. And if you have any issues, any trouble, uh, let me know and we'll figure it out together. Even if, if the, uh, you miss a deadline or uh, the computer crashes or something like that, don't just suffer in silence. I'll definitely try to work with you to solve that. So that's what I was going to say about the exam and practical one. Uh, I hope that that relieved some concerns. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them to the chat or just unmute yourself. Uh, like I said, they are material. They are the questions that you've seen. I don't do any curveballs. So that's why I really, really encourage my students to do those quizzes and do those practice anatomies because that's where I pull the exam and practical questions. I don't see any messages coming through or hear anything, but if, if you have something, feel free to just jump in, even if I'm uh, talking. But I just want to be mindful of the time and appreciate you being here. So I'm just going to keep going unless, until, unless I hear something else. What I was going to do next is to really give you kind of a condensed version of the chapters six and seven, that what are the key points that you need to know?
Um, and really where I was going to start was noticing that your body is covered by all kinds of membranes. And it's not just the skin. We also have other membranes. For example, if we look at any openings of your body, whether it's through nostrils or oral cavity or through ears or uh, anal canal or anywhere else, all of the surfaces in your body are covered by layers. And whether it's skin or whether it's another type of a membrane, uh, that varies a little bit. But uh, we will see that there's a purpose that we cover these surfaces, we line these cavities, we perform protective sheets. And for example, in case of synovial joints that you see there, uh, these are important. Uh, for our joints function, and we'll we'll have a look of that once we get to talk about those in the later weeks coming. Uh, here I have labeled some of the places, so mucous membranes, for example, lining the oral cavity, nasal cavity, serous membranes, forming these uh, cavities within our body, for example, circling the lungs, circling the abdominal, uh, cavity cutaneous membrane is the skin, the big topic of our this week's first chapter. And like I said, synovial membranes are found in certain joints, such as a knee joint that's illustrated there. So, uh, largely our focus is going to be on those cutaneous membranes. Uh, that's the fancy word that we use when we talk about the skin. And skin typically forms the outermost protective layer for your body. And actually, skin is really important. I did some looking and up on this, and about 16% of your body mass is represented by the skin. So skin, that makes skin the largest organ in your body. The largest internal organ is going to be liver, but uh, largest organ at all, even beyond that is going to be skin. Um, skin is an important one for us to get familiar. I have many doctor friends who have gone into dermatology and sometimes it's not as uh, exciting for some students to think about such as then, for example, dealing with heart, how to get the heart to pump again. But I often hear these colleagues of mine making a very valid point that skin is the first layer that the first thing about you that many people see. So if we can help patients who have skin issues, we can really improve their life and quality of their life. And um, the other thing that I'm trying to showcase here is that all of our skins do vary. There's a great amount of variation. Our skin can give us a lot of medical information about the patient as well, uh, how they are doing, what's happening currently in their body. Uh, a lot of things show signs and symptoms through the skin, but also about the history of that patient. Uh, how has their life up to the point has been, at this point has been in terms of how, the, what kind of of signs and uh, marks can we see from the skin. So it really is important. Uh, if we're thinking of the purpose of the skin, there's quite a few purposes that we will end up seeing uh, protecting mechanically, for example, for cuts and bumps, chemical protection barrier against many things like as weak acid bases, we're also providing thermal protection, so protecting us from environment, whether it's too cold or warm skin and the hair in that form barriers. Uh, also UV protection, so for example, uh, our skin uh, kind of helps us not to get as damaged with the UV ray rays as otherwise, so we have certain changes that can take place if there's UV exposure. Um, also forming a barrier against microbes, for example, that slightly oily surface and that sweat are really good, uh, good protective uh, form a really good protective barrier against many different kinds of microbes. And skin also plays a really important role in our fluid balance regulation, making sure that we don't dry out, but giving us a way to absorb things and so on. Of course, skin also cushions and deeper body organs and insulates 
also our body. And there's other things that could be considered such as vitamin D synthesis that happens on the skin. Uh, excretion of urea and uric acid also happen to a certain extent through the skin. So many, many things to know about the skin. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go back just quickly. Uh, with the skin, we also talk about various different kinds of glands. So that's going to be something that we are going to have to consider. We also look at the hair that's associated with the skin and uh, we also talk about nails so that's kind of the introduction to that and um, when we look at the skin we're going to go through three different layers at large and we're starting with the outermost layer which is our epidermis epidermis is made of keratinized stratified squamous epithelia so this is what gives the skin its protective properties this keratin and notice that the very outermost layers of the uh, epidermis are actually dead skin cells so we're constantly making new layer underneath as we're constantly losing the outermost layer so it's a kind of an ongoing process but epidermis was that outermost layer that we see for the skin uh, epidermis can be divided into other layers uh, and often if we were to do this it would have to do with the fact that we're doing things like uh, histology we're taking microscopic samples and staining them really making these layers stand out if you want to make a note of those different uh, layers good for you i'm not really uh, feeling that that's uh, really something that i'm gonna question you a lot about the second layer underneath the uh our epidermis is gonna be dermis this is the thicker layer and really contains more than just these uh, skin cells on the surface. This is really the strong, flexible, connective tissue material that we find here. So when we do leather objects from other animal skins, it is this dermis that we use to prepare those leather objects. Uh, dermis contains high amount of nerve endings, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, glands. Even though those glands have to penetrate through the upper layer, the gland body is located within the dermis. Uh, same goes for the skin's root as well. So you can think of uh, a little bit if you were thinking epidermis, that that's where we see the epithelial cells, but then once we get to the dermis, that's where we see the connective tissue and other structures. Uh, dermis as well can be divided into two separate layers. But again, that's not probably something that I would quiz you too much on about. Moving onwards, a very uh, low last layer of the skin is known as our hypodermis or sometimes also called subcutaneous tissue. Uh, depending on what resources you're using, some books classify that as a skin, some don't, but that's the final layer. That's where we find things like, for example, adipose tissue and we transition away to the other layers that we find underneath the skin. Uh, really quickly, this picture that I have here is just to illustrate. It's a microscopic cross section of a skin and you can see those different layers. It was important for me to show that it's not just something that we teach you to torture you, but you can really see that epidermis, dermis and hypodermis uh, layers on uh, when you study the actual sample. Um, in terms of the skin and the color of the skin, I wanted to mention a couple of words about that. Uh, there's different kinds of pigments that contribute to the color of the skin. So uh, melanin is the first one of these that we look at. Melanin has many different colors that it can take depending on how much melanin we find in the skin. Anywhere from yellow, brown to all the way to the black color. Um, one good way of thinking of melanin is that our individuals who are known as albinos would not have any melanin. So you, it gives you an idea what a lack of melanin would do. Uh, I've seen that so recently some people have been using tanning products where they are activating the melanin production on their skin. So that's really that gives us that tanned color, yellowish, brownish, black color. 
The next pigment that I wanted to mention is going to be our carotene. Carotene is responsible for giving us this yellowish orangey color. Um, and in fact, carrots contain high amounts of carotene. So we sometimes see if we have patients who eat diet that contains extremely lots of carotene, that will even show up on their skin color. And last, what that I wanted to mention, but no means the least important, is going to be the fact that we also see the blood through our skin. So we can see that hemoglobin, the red color from the blood through the skin. So that contributes to the color that we see. So sometimes when people are, for example, about to faint, uh, all the blood goes from the skin where a lar large quantities of the blood are st is stored. Uh, it disappears to other parts or moves to other parts of the body. It doesn't disappear and individual might look really, really pale. That's because we don't see that blood. We don't see that hemoglobin that we would normally see. Uh, also, this explains why sometimes when you get a little flustered, say, for example, a little embarrassed, we might get that red color rising to our cheeks or elsewhere. Uh, that is our nervous system response that triggers that we carry blood to the, those body surfaces. So it's really a mixture of multiple pigments that gives us our skin's to the color. Uh, there are many different kinds of clinical conditions where we see alterations in the skin color, uh, such as cyanosis, jaundice, uh, bruises. So really from the skin color, we can figure out a lot of things. Uh, but I don't really think that we go in too much of a detail in terms of pathology. We're saving that for your later classes. Uh, uh, that you might do as part of your degree, but I wanted to show some there and you're more than welcome to dig in a little bit deeper with your text. If we're looking at the skin, I really like this diagram that we have available here and we can see a few important structures. So I'm highlighting those from this uh, book or this picture just to kind of make sure that we have a rough idea of important things. So the first thing that I wanted to mention here are the sepaqueous oil glands that are typically located um, at the root of the hair, for example, giving that hair a little bit of protection in that case. Uh, these produce oil that really keeps the hair from becoming brittle and softens and moistens and also helps to kill bacteria. Uh, we do have other kinds of glands, and let's see if I have those labeled. Yes, we have uh, our sweat glands here. Uh, they're responsible for the production of the sweat. Uh, sweat actually is naturally odorless. It doesn't give us a smell. It's actually only that bacteria that then live uh, where we find sweat that give it its scent. But sweat itself is, does not have a uh, smell. Uh, other thing that we're seeing on this uh, picture is going to be a tiny, tiny muscle. I believe that as far as I know, it's the smallest muscle that you can find in your body. So often when we talk about muscles, we think of these big, bulky skeletal muscles that generate movements, but we have small muscles. And this small muscle, erector villi, is associated, there's one associated with each hair that you have on the surfaces. And the purpose of erector villi is that it helps to lift those hair up. And that's all about what your uh, food for thought is uh, an activity is going to be all about. So I won't go into too much of a detail. I don't want to spoil it for you. Uh, here we see the structure of the hair. So I often want to point out to my students that hair itself, that you see the visible part, is going to be dead tissue, uh, highly keratinized. But it is hair is produced. There's constantly new hair being made from the uh, sh uh, from the uh, root of the hair and the hair follicles. So there's a lot of cell division happening, producing that new hair. But uh, that shaft, the visible part, is, is going to be keratinized dead tissue. Uh, hair color is going to be due to the melanocytes. Uh, so we're seeing those pigments playing a role there as well. Um, Next slide that I have here just mentions a couple of things about 
nails. I just want to remind ourselves of those. So near nails are heavily keratinized structures. We see things like a nail bed there. We see the root nail is constantly growing from the root onwards. It can take a while to replace if there's damage. The nail really naturally does not have any color because it doesn't contain pigment. But thinking of the function of the nail is kind of, I think, a useful uh, thing. Nails have kind of, I would say, twofold, two main functions. They cover and protect these uh, endings of our body. Think of fingers and toes. If we didn't have nails, it would be much easier to damage this soft tissue that's at the end of the uh, bone there. So nails really have this kind of a protective function of these fingers and toes. Uh, in addition to that, nails play an important role in helping us to have fine grip. So that's been something that's been really big evolutionarily for us as a mankind has developed. Uh, kind of keeping up with the speed, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of words about the burns. I don't have any scary pictures on this presentation, but I'm pretty sure you can see those on my pre-recorded lecture videos. But really with the burns, uh, what we're seeing is that there's many causes that can cause burns. Whether it's heat, whether it's electrical burn, whether it's UV radiation burn, whether it's a chemical burn, and so on. So not all burns originate from just the sun. Um, really what we're seeing at the burns, there's different categories, different severities, but there's a damage to the skin. And skin is really important because it kept all the stuff out that needed to stay out, and it kept all the stuff in that needed to stay in, and it was a regulatory uh, structure as well. So if we now are missing that skin from some body part, that can become a huge issue. Two of the big things that I wanna mention regarding skin damage uh, due to the burns, uh, two things that we would be concerned would be dehydration of the patient, so they might be losing a lot of uh, fluids through that burn area, and also infections getting to the body because there's that damage to that skin. Uh, how we measure the extent of the burn, uh, there's two factors to consider. There's the severity, so you often hear people talking about first, second, third, and even fourth degree burns, uh, with the first degree burns really just being that uh, the skin is slightly red and swollen. Uh, second, we get the red, we get the pain to that area, and we also get blisters forming. Third degree, um, what's characteristic to that is that often there's no pain, and that's actually a problem. We want to feel the pain when we lose that sensation of the pain. That tells that the damage is significantly deeper, so both epidermis and dermis now have damaged. And uh, third degree burns, often we're starting to look at that we might need skin grafts or degree is really when the skin has and tissues have damaged all the way through to the bone, muscles, tendon, or wherever. We typically find these burns being really dry, leathery, and amputation might be what, what is needed at those cases. But in addition to that, uh, classifying burns based on their severity, another classification that we need to consider is by considering how large of an area has burned. And we have this rule of nines that we often use, that body can be divided into different areas, and if each area represents nine, percent of your uh, surface area, it makes it a little bit easier to kind of calculate that how large uh, surface area of the patient's body has burned. So with this logic, your body would be divided into 11 different body areas and each of those representing 9% of the surface area. So that's an interesting thought, an interesting way to consider it. And I think that that brings us to the very last thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to this chapter and just really quickly kind of touch up on, on the various skin cancers. And um, skin cancers are some of the most common form of cancers in the humans. And really a big risk for that is that excessive exposure to UV radiation, whether it's someone who's uh, 
exposed to the direct sunlight a lot, or we had a bigger problem, I think, in 90s with those tanning beds. So those are kind of becoming less popular. Uh, with the cancers and with the skin cancers, really the big question is that is that uh, uncontrolled cell division site, is the cancer spreading or is it localized only onto that area where we see those tissue changes? Are we talking about benign or malignant cancer? So that's a big thing to pay attention to. So that was all that I have about the integumentary system that I wanted to highlight on chapter six. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, just jump in, unmute yourself, post them to the chat. I'll also make a little break here, but uh, then I'm going to move on to look at the next chapter, which is the chapter seven. And chapter seven really introduces us to the skeletal tissue and bones and also talks a little bit about different kinds of cartilages. And the reason why I want to talk about skeletal cartilages is that cartilages are really what your skeleton starts as. So uh, during early development, your body actually doesn't have fully ossified bones. Uh, all of the, what is going to turn into a bone is still cartilage. So the cartilage slowly gets ossified, turns into the bone. Uh, so that partially is, is part of the story and part of the reason why I wanted to spend time on that. Uh, we've got some nice pictures there, for example, an X-ray of the uh, developing fetus. You see that the bones are not yet fully formed. Uh, in fact, the development of the bones continues far into our uh, early 20s. So, in terms of the cartilages, there's three cartilage types that I wanted to highlight. Um, and really, I'm just going to go through these kind of quickly hyaline cartilage is the first one on this picture uh, that you see on the right hand side shown with kind of this lighter blue color. This is really flexible type of cartilage, the most common type of cartilage and found in many joints uh, as the costal cartilage of your ribs. So not the bony part of your ribs, but the part that connects those bony ribs to your sternum. Uh, also really important in your uh, trachea windpipe. No questions, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and um, we also see, for example, your nose tip would be made of hyaline cartilage. So various different places where we see hyaline cartilage present. Let's have a look at the elastic cartilage then. Elastic cartilage really is more elastic as the name proposes. You'll see elastic cartilage, for example, giving the shape and the structure of the external ear. Also, the epiglottis, the kind of uh, little flat-like structure that we find at the uh, level of the throat kind of preventing liquids and foods from going going to the trachea to our windpipe and directing them down to oesophagus so uh, that's another place where later on on your bio 202 you will get to see elastic cartilage um, fiber cartilage is the last one that I wanted to mention. Fiber cartilage is made of collagen, collagen fibers, really strong structures. And we find fiber cartilage, for example, at the knee menisci, uh, strengthening the knee structures. Uh, also between our different vertebras on our spinal spine. So there's these cushions, little discs again between these bones that allow us to move and also provide a little bit of shock absorption uh, for, for our uh, vertebral column. And we also find fiber cartilage at the pubic symphysis, so this part where the hips join together. And actually, during giving birth, that uh, pubic symphysis fiber cartilage band typically uh, can, uh, can open up so that the baby can be born. So uh, there are some sometimes when the fiber cartilage does give in, but that's, a, that's a kind of a little bit more of an uh, exception. I wanted to really quickly talk a little bit about the bones then and functions of the bones. So let's consider that a little bit. 
So there, there are many ways of classifying functions of the bones, but let's do one approach. So bones really give our body the support, the scaffolding, the framework where everything else is hanging to. I often talk to my students that if you didn't have a skeleton, you would be just this blob on the floor with muscles and other material just wiggling. It's really that bones that give us our structure. Uh, in addition, bones kind of give us our shape, uh, give us our form of the body, if you want to think of that way. Other thing that bones are really important in is giving our, uh, or protecting our body and protecting different parts of the body, different organs. So really the most important structures, most vital organs are often protected inside bony structures. So think of, for example, your brain inside the skull. You can't really get by if you don't have a brain, if brain gets damaged. So we're protecting it as much as we can. We see the same protecting the lungs and the heart within the rib cage as an example. Uh, other thing that I think is really kind of explanation to students why you first learn about bones and you learn the bones and then we move on to the skeletal muscles and muscular system is that really bones and muscles work together to generate movements. So just having the muscle itself is not cre going to create the movement if it's not attached to two different ends. And typically most muscles overlap different joints and as they contract and relax, they generate these movements as we're moving these bones and these joints that connect the bones uh, in relation to each other. So really bones and skeletal system is really important for the movement. Um, Few words that I wanted to mention in terms of bones also being sites where a lot of things are stored. So we see, for example, calcium, salts, minerals being stored in your bones. Uh, really building a strong skeleton is really important, especially for females pre-menopause. Uh, so I, I really encourage any, any calcium that you can consume, whether it's in the shape of uh, ice cream or other treats, Feel with free conscience to do so uh, if you're able to consume that. That's going to be something that's a long term health investment for you to do. Um, bones are also really important as a site where blood cells are being formed. Produ blood cells are being produced at the bone marrow, and that process of producing blood cells is known as hematopoiesis. Uh, poesis term refers to making of, hemato refers to blood in general. Uh, once you get to your bio 202, we spend a great amount of time talking about that, uh, but I'm just putting it out there now as kind of a hint of what's to come later in your studies. Uh, in addition, what I wanted to say about the uh, functions of the bone and kind of probably also going a little bit on that storage concept is that uh, we store also triglycerides, so the components of the fat tissue, fats uh, in, in the bones. So it's important in that sense as well. And a lot of hormones do have bones as part of the processes or the chains of events that lead into the hormone production, hormone activation, and so on. Um, when we look at the skeleton and different bones, and we'll get to do that later on in this semester or in the next few, next few weeks, uh, bones can be at large classified into two compartments, either as being part of the axial skeleton or a pendicular skeleton. So axial skeleton really covers your head, neck, and trunk, so rib cage and vertebral column. Uh, Axial skeleton is really forming the long axis of the body. And uh, often we see in axial skeleton bones that those are the bones that protect things. Think of also in terms of protection that your vertebral column protects the spinal cord inside it. A pendicular skeleton instead uh, is going to be all the parts that are attached kind of as additional parts from our trunk. So upper limbs, lower limbs, 
uh, forming this uh, shoulder and hips, these big joints of movement. Um, I think that the hardest part for students when they separate between axial and appendicular is to notice that your scapula, so your shoulder blade, and also your clavicle, so your collarbone, those are part of the appendicular skeleton, as are your hips. So uh, th those are usually the parts where it gets a little trickier. I think of a pendicular skeleton as a thing that you attach if you ever applied for a job where they ask you to include appendix or you have a written project where you can include additional material. Those are appendixes in uh, English language. So appendix, pendicular skeleton is these additional parts. You can still live without them, but they're, they're very, very useful. At least that's how I think of them, but you might come up with a better way of thinking of those. Uh, let's classify bones a little bit. We're keeping it on a general level. So we can classify bones, for example, based on their shape. So long bones literally are long uh, within the limbs. So we can see, for example, humerus, um, femur, things like that. Short bones instead, they are very, very short, very tiny, uh, typically things like carpal bones. So the bones of your wrist or your kneecap would be a good example of a short bone. Um, flat bones instead, they are thin. They're flat like the name proposes. We see, for example, your skull is made of by multiple flat bones joining together. Your sternum, your chest bone would be another good example, and your scapula, so the shoulder blade. Um, we do have a group of irregular bones, and this is really where we throw all other bones that we can't classify into any other groups, I feel sometimes. So it's really the kind of dumping ground. Uh, things like your vertebra, so those bones that make up your vertebral column would be a good example of those. Um, I am going to keep up just going, but as always, just feel free to shout out. Bone can be also classified as either being compact or spongy. So compact bone is not going to be probably too shocking. It's usually the outer layer of most bones. That's the hard bone, usually very strong. But we see that many bones that are larger bones contain inside spongy bones. So it literally looks a little bit like a sponge and the, this honeycomb like structure. The purpose of that is to reduce some of the weight. So, for example, you'll end up seeing that birds' bones uh, are hollow inside. So, to reduce some of the weight of the skeletal system and bones, uh, we do have spongy bone inside. Think of, for example, the skull. If it was solid bone, it would make our head really heavy. It would be a lot of work to keep it up. Uh, I also want to highlight, and I know I'm going a little fast, but uh, you can always stop me if I'm going too fast. I want to highlight a few parts of a long bone. So let's have a look of that. So we have diaphysis. Diaphysis is the kind of the shaft, the most of the length, the middle part of a long bone. So we see it here. Uh, we have epiphysis. Epiphysis are these ends of the long bone. Uh, they are mostly spongy bone, if you look at, whereas within the diaphysis, we have this uh, central cavity that's important. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, what else? Here I've highlighted periosteum. Periosteum is really the outside covering around the bone. So there's a th thin connective tissue layer there. Uh, I've also marked, I believe, uh, epiphyseal line or epiphyseal plate. This is the growth uh, plate uh, th where the bone grows to both directions. So uh, very, very active during the early puberty uh, when the large amounts of growth, for example, in length happen. Uh, you see the cavity inside the long bones, diaphysis. Uh, this is where the bone marrow is housed uh, in the middle. There's a few others, but uh, I think that those were the most urgent ones that I wanted to show. Here we're seeing a cross-section of that uh, diaphysis region, especially with the bone marrow inside there. We'll have a look of this microscopic structure in just a second, but notice that there's a lot of blood vessels supplying the bone as well. There's many different kinds of bone markings, so in our course it's not enough just to name bones. We might name 
parts of the bones. And that's really what we'll do next week. But I've listed some there just to give you an idea. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of those. I think the easier way to learn these different bone markings is as you are covering the bones. But in general, I say to my students that bone markings, any depressions, any bumps, they are signs that there's something either attached or passing next to that area. So you can read a lot from these different markings of the bones. Um, next thing that I wanted to talk about is in a very, very general level, just quickly for us to have a look of different kinds of bone cells. And I refer these often as our O cells after the osteo <laughs> tissue. So there's really three types of bone cells that I want you to know. And the first one is going to be our osteoblast. Osteoblasts are responsible for making new bone. They regulate calcium concentration, mineral uh, deposition in the body, and so on. But those are really the cells that make new bone. Osteocytes, instead, are kind of adult bone cells. Uh, you'll notice that osteocytes often have these almost like arms that of an octopus uh, branches that reach out, and it is actually the osteoblast that builds the new bone around it until it gets trapped inside. Uh, I, I kind of these branches are then the connections to the uh, other bone cells. Uh, and that's really important in sensing pressure and cracks and things like that. So really the bone strengthening is uh, a process where we put stress on the bone and that makes bone stronger. So how I explain osteocytes often for my students is that think of these osteoblasts making new bone and they make new bone to all directions around themselves. But as they do so, they also kind of trap themselves inside. If you've ever been washing floor with a mop and you've mopped yourself into a corner uh, that everything else around you is nice and clean and you can't walk out, that would be a good analog to an osteoblast becoming an osteocyte as it matures and gets kind of trapped in there. And the final types of O cells that I wanted to mention are going to be our osteoclasts. Osteoclasts break down old bone, so bone is constantly being recycled. We make new bone, we break down old bone, and in that way we're able to kind of strengthen bone where that needs to happen. Um, we also notice that osteoclast actually contains multiple nuclei, so um, they are made in the bone marrow from multiple uh, cells together. So that's a really quick introduction, but the big thing to remember from this is that they are connected. Uh, they, there's a cycle of making new bone and breaking down old bone. Here's a microscopic view of a compact bone, and you can see here really how this uh, mature bone cell has gotten trapped in the middle and has this, has built new bone around itself, and it has these branches that you can occasionally see, uh, I think that here you'll see that we have many different kinds of blood vessels, nerves, uh, lymphatic vessels running in these empty spaces, even inside the compact bone. So bone is very much a living structure. I think that there's sometimes misconception about that. Uh, what I have next here is really showing that bone is constantly being remodeled based on the stress. A physical stress can be good for the bone development as long as it doesn't damage it. So we kind of strengthen it where it needs to. You'll see at the left upper corner how it really is this kind of a, a cycle of these, these bones uh, taking turns. Um, in formation of the bony skeleton, there's really two types of ossification, endochondral and intramembranous. And I'm just going to leave those just to keep up the speed uh, for you to really have a look from the textbook. But feel free to ask uh, if you struggle with that part, but just two ways how ossification can happen. I do want to mention it really quickly, and I'm aware of the time, so that's why I'm keeping up the seed, and really quickly about fracture. So fracture is really 
classified or defined as a break in the line of continuity of the bone. And there's many ways of classifying fractions uh, and they, they vary. Uh, so you see a lot of different ways of doing that. So we can talk about uh, whether the ends of the bone are aligned or dis become disaligned due to the fracture. So whether they are displaced uh, or non-displaced. In non-displaced, the ends of the bone that has cracked are still next to each other as they should be. In displaced one, they've slid off from where they should be. They're out of alignment. Uh, we can also look at how complete the fracture of the bone is. In complete fracture, the bone is broken all the way through, whereas we can also have incomplete bone fractures where it's only partially fractured and a part of the bone is still held together at that fracture site. Another way to look at fractures is whether that fracture has caused skin to be penetrated through or whether that fracture is there but we don't see through the skin. So that again can be a one way to classify and if the skin gets fractured, if skin gets broken, there can be other things that, that come with that that we need to consider. There are many other ways uh, we can classify fractures. For example, are we seeing multiple uh, fragments? Are the bones crushed due to compression? Is there a twisting? Uh, is there a breaking growth plane? Uh, is the bone pushed in, for example, from where it should be? Or green stick, for example, the broken but not fully kind of a young tree stick kind of a fracture. So there's many, many ways of classifying these fractures. I guess that's what I'm wanting to say. Uh, how do we treat fact fractures? Just going back here real quickly. Uh, we really want to realign these bones in so that they're where they should be. Uh, it can be just a doctor placing them back, or it might be that we need pins and needles, uh, wires, uh, cast to se secure those. Uh, and the second one is the immobilizing of this fracture site, typically done with the cast, so we don't make that fracture site worse. Well, let me move on to the very last thing that I really wanted to mention uh, when we talk about the bones. Uh, one clinical condition, uh, there's many dis disorders, but uh, this is the one that I kind of think that we might talk a little bit. Osteoporosis, where the bone breaks down. So the osteoclasts are very, very active here. Um, this is especially relevant to the woman. Women, estrogen is involved here, so menopause causes higher risk of osteoporosis, lifestyle also plays a role. Um, so we're seeing this bone breakdown being high at the higher rate than making the new bone with the osteoblast. Uh, we see osteoporosis especially impacting spine and neck of femur, where we find spongy bones, so fib fractures are often associated here. Um, really, uh, lifestyle choices might play a role also why uh, osteoporosis uh, happens for some treatments. When we think of that, um, there are things that you can do. There are beneficial things, having a lot of calcium in the diet, vitamin D supplements, uh, also giving a little bit of stress during the development of the bone so that bone has a chance, a chance to strengthen. And we do see hormone replacement therapy be being used, especially in women who are going to menopause, to kind of slow down the bone loss. It can't reverse that, but uh, it can assist with that. So genetics, calcium, vitamin D, uh, all of those are, are important when it comes to the osteoporosis. And that really brings us to the end of what I was going to say in terms of reviewing the key points of these two chapters. Uh, if you have any questions at this time, feel free to jump, just, uh, jump, uh, unmute yourself or drop to the chat. Um, I'm not sure, do you feel that you want to look at the homework assignments? There's quite a bit of those. I think it's very, very self-explanatory as we've done before. So I wasn't planning to do that, but if someone's really eager for us to have a look of those, I am willing to do so. But uh, if not, I think that you've got everything that I had planned for today for our session. 
So really the floor is yours. Let me know if you have any questions, if you want us to have a look of anything else more. Otherwise, I appreciate you joining me today and I hope you have really good rest of the evening. Uh, I hear you. I appreciate it. So uh, what I will do is that I will have a look of those deadlines a little bit if we can give you a little more time to work on the assignment so no one's going to be overwhelmed or stressed. <laughs> But that's all I have for tonight. So thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for being here. Have a good night and have a good week. Bye. And that really stops our recording as well. Uh, I don't have anything else to add, but as always, please do remember that you're not on your own on this class. Uh, I'm only a message away. I make myself uh, very available also outside the office hours. So please, please, please do not feel that you have to battle by yourself. Uh, let me know where I can help and I will totally assist you. Uh, I hope you have a very good rest of the week. And like I said, keep an eye off those announcements. Uh, I'll see what I can do to kind of eliminate a little bit of that stress. Uh, I know that it's a busy week. So let's see if we can uh, make it a little less stressful, even though we still need to cover everything. Uh, so keep an eye off the announcements. That's it from me for tonight. Uh, have a good week.